Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time uh, to discuss consideration for standards and test methods of immersion cooling fluids. My name is Atori Parente. I work with the Engineer Materials Division at UL Solutions. <coughs> so whenever a new and innovative product is brought to you all for certification, it's always an exciting time, but it's also challenging. Um, the challenging with immersion cooling fluids lies within the fact that we have so many different types of fluids, one, and as Puneet mentioned, uh, the interaction between those fluids with a vast array of materials uh, over the course of the fluid's lifetime at elevated temperatures uh, can pose developing certification requirements uh, uh, quite complex, right? <clears throat> so on single phase fluids, we have hydrocarbons, synthetic esters, natural esters, and then our two phase fluids are fluorochemical types. Despite these challenges, uh, we have to be able to promulgate a certification because there's key stakeholders that are looking, looking for our help, right? Insurance companies, retailers, consumers, they all want to mitigate risk. Then, of course, we have our building codes, right? The International Building Code, NFPA 70, which is the National Electric Code, and NFP 75, which is Fire Protection Equipment for Data Centers. They have requirements for certification as well. <coughs> and then the folks that enforce these codes, our authorities have in jurisdiction, electrical inspectors, fire marshals, they really rely on, rely on certification to get that insurance that the installation is done safely. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we talk about certification, depending on where you're at geographically, you know, it could be a self-certification, or in the case of North America, it's typically done by NERDL, which is a national recognized test laboratory. And they do third-party testing. <coughs> the NERDL accreditation is given uh, to the lab by uh, OSHA. And at UL, we have several different uh, certification schemes. And I'd like to talk about them Briefly, only because uh, I think it's important to understand where immersion fluids potentially will lie when it comes to <coughs> this type of certification. Thank you, Rolf. So when we talk about a listed device, <coughs> it's complete in its construction. All foreseeable uh, hazards from the standard have been addressed. And it could be something as complex as a rack system that we saw in the expo hall, or something as simple as your toaster that's on your counter at home. When we talk about classification, only a very specific hazard has been addressed by the certification. So at UL, for example, we classify refrigerants, and we do so establishing a flammability limit, upper limit and lower limit, and that information is used by the HVAC manufacturers and those certifying the HVAC uh, equipment so they understand what the maximum and minimum charges uh, could be for the refrigerant. <coughs> Another certification scheme we have is a recognized component. And this is one I want you to keep in mind because I think it's quite applicable to uh, immersion cooling fluids. So it's an incomplete device and its intent is to be used in a listed product. And the certification is established with some conditions of acceptability. So this bucket is a very good uh, candidate for immersion, immersion cooling fluids. And last but not least, we have unlisted components. Unlisted components, unlike the other three, are not published. Um, it's still a component like a recognized component, but the certification is done with a specific end product in mind. So the evaluation is done in conjunction, if you will. So in order to certify a product, you need standards, right? You need requirements. And one, one standard that uh, applies to immersion cooling uh, fluids is IEC 62368-1. The third edition has some key clauses uh, that address insulating liquids. And there's three, three areas of concern, right? We have electric strength, compatibility of the insulating liquid, and then flammability of the insulating liquid. <clears throat> so the insulating fluid is considered a critical component, so it needs to get tied down. And when I mean tied down, and this is where the certification kind of comes into play, is that not only does it have to meet certain requirements, but from UL's perspective, it should undergo follow-up, annual follow-up, to ensure that the formulation remains consistent, uh, there's no changes, whether inadvertently or on purpose of the formulation. And some of these tests that are done to kind of uh, characterize the material are analytical tests like IR, uh, maybe specific gravity. It all depends on the material. So within 62368 are some hard requirements that we should be cognizant of. 
The first being auto ignition temperature, not less than 300 degrees Celsius, a flash point higher than 135 degrees Celsius, and then there's a 60 day compatibility test that's kind of incorporated with the dielectric strength testing. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about auto ignition temperature. The test, so essentially you're filling a vessel with the fluid in question, heating it up, and finding out at what temperature the vapors ignite without the presence of an external uh, ignition source. So this is a little different than Flashpoint in the sense that with Flashpoint there is an external uh, ignition source, whether it's an electric heated wire or a flame, for example. <clears throat> so let's see how these requirements in 62368 compared to those that are called out uh, with OCP requirements. And thank you all for uh, um, getting those to align because previously, as uh, Ralph had mentioned, uh, you know, it was 250 degrees Celsius was the uh, um, minimum temperature, but now that the two are in harmony, uh, and they both uh, are done, conducted using the same uh, ASTM standard, which is E659. So just to reiterate, the test align, and so do the requirements. So that's wonderful. <clears throat> Moving on, there is another uh, test for flammability to, to characterize the, the fluid. Um, it could either be a, a flash point by closed cup or open cup. So let's start with closed cup and kind of talk about the difference between the two. So the ASTM method for flash point is ASTM D93. It's flash point by Penske Martins. As the name suggests, uh, we fill up a, a test cup basically with the fluid, heat it up, and there's a lid that kind of traps the vapors in the heat and that headspace of the cup. And we're looking for the, the, the minimum temperature at which a flash occurs. And again, with this test, there is an external heating source. <clears throat> it's good, suitable for measurements of flash temperatures between 40 degrees Celsius and up to 370 degrees Celsius. Another common test for flash point is Cleveland Open Cup. As the name uh, suggests, that the test is done open to the ambient in the lab. Uh, so there's no lid covering those, that headspace. So oftentimes the Cleveland Open Cup will yield lower results, um, or I should say higher results than the closed cup me method. <clears throat> so one can imagine that the uh, closed cup method is a little more conservative. So we need to keep that in mind because it's one thing to establish a test temperature, but then not having the appropriate or uh, understanding the uh, method of the test uh, could influence that, right? And another measurement that could be uh, taken from the Cleveland Open Cup is your fire point. Uh, this is a, a, a characterization test that you probably heard, and it's, it's very, it's, the test is run in conjunction with uh, the flash point. Uh, the only difference is when the, if the vapors that ignite sustain uh, flammability for more than five seconds, uh, that's your fire point. So obviously fire point is typically higher temperature than flash point. So let's take a look at how the requirements uh, between 62368 compare to what we've been working on with the Open Compute Project. So the Open Compute Project's requirements are actually more conservative than 62368. Um, the requirement is 150 degrees Celsius. Uh, there is a difference between the methods, as I mentioned. Uh, open Commute pro pro Project is proposing uh, the Cleveland Open Cup method, which is ASTM D92, whereas 62368 calls out uh, Flashpoint by Penske Martins, the ASTM D93. So a little different requirements um, and test methods are, are different as well. <laughs> So again, the key two differences between the flashpoint tests, one is done with a, a closed cup. Uh, the, the Penske Martins will yield uh, typically uh, lower results for flammability. Uh, the closed cup or the open cup method can, can, you can derive a fire point uh, value from that as well. So moving on from flammability, we have dielectric strength. The OCP requirement for dielectric strength is six kilovolts per millimeter over the life of the fluid. This is much different than IEC 62368 in the sense that <clears throat> that standard, the, as I had mentioned, the test is done after a 60-day compatibility, and it's, it's done inside a tank. It's not a pre-selection test where we're just testing the fluid. It's done in the actual immersion tank with all the hardware, cabling, et cetera. So it's kind of a, a 
two-part test, right? We're looking at how that fluid interacts with the materials, with the elastomers, the polymers that Kenneth talked about, um, and how, how that interaction takes place, and then if there is an interaction, how it potentially contaminates the fluid and could lower the dielectric value. So when we talk about pre-selection testing, and, and that's really the goal here, I think, for, you know, if I'm a, a immersion cooling fluid manufacturer, I want to be able to supply a tank manufacturer with the fluid that meets all the check boxes, right? Uh, so when we say pre-selection, it's done on the actual fluid. So there's some test methods that are, are commonly used for uh, dielectric strength. Uh, one being ASTM B1816 and IEC 60156. All three of these methods are the same in the sense that we're hunting for a breakdown voltage, right? So we're starting at zero, ramping it up consistently, and trying to find that voltage in which breakdown occurs. Some of the key differences are if you look at uh, the electrode shapes, right? Some are spherical, others are flat shaped. And the gap between them are also different. So for the sake of uh, OCP requirements, that six kV per millimeter, the preferred method is ASTM D1816, which allows for a one millimeter gap. We can estimate dielectric uh, strength values using the 60156 methods, but due to the uh, gap spacing, there'd be some calculations involved, right? And then another key difference between 1816 and 60156 is the ramp rate. Uh, the ramp rate for D1816 is, is much quicker than that of IEC 60156. I haven't talked about ASTM D877 much because uh, that test method is more uh, used for uh, as-received fluids. It's not very uh, sensitive to moisture content, and moisture does have a very uh, big effect on dielectric strength. Um, so if, if the fluid absorbs moisture, the electric strength proportionally goes down. So that's something to consider. <clears throat> so when we mentioned, you know, the IEC 62368 test method, uh, it's different in the sense that we're not hunting for a voltage, rather applying a, a dielectric uh, a withstand test using the peak voltages or maximum load on the system and ensuring that breakdown doesn't occur between the actual fluid or, or the insulating jackets of the components, for example. <clears throat> and again, that voltage is determined uh, by the peak available energy. So in summary, how do the requirements compare uh, between what the OCPs are proposing and what's called out in 62368? The 62368 uh, test is done with the whole system, right? So it's a little bit uh, more of a real life situation, if you will, but in some cases, maybe not practical big pictures in, in terms of, you know, if I'm a fluid manufacturer, how do I ensure that it's going to go in any tank? If I'm, if I'm a, a tank manufacturer and I, or a, a data center immersion uh, cooling system manufacturer, I don't want to find that at the 12th hour that uh, my fluid doesn't meet a spec, right? So um, there's a difference between the two tests. Um, the six volts uh, per millimeter uh, is, is established with the ASTM D1816 method. Uh, so the two tests are different, uh, but at the end, the idea is that um, we shouldn't have breakdown uh, below the ma maximum working voltage of the system. <clears throat> All right, so call to action. So. Like I said, we haven't, had, uh, we haven't established a standard yet, a formal standard uh, for the immersion cooling fluid. Our goal is to do so relatively soon. Uh, we've had great support and, and glad to contribute uh, support to the OCP. And uh, we're looking for industry experts in, in the area of fluids uh, who've done these research studies about compatibility because that, that's really the, uh, for us anyways, uh, one of the big hiccups, right? Um, ensuring that over that lifetime of the fluid, however that's uh, defined, whether it's five years, as Beneath mentioned, maybe longer, uh, that interaction between the fluid and those materials uh, doesn't cause an unsafe uh, condition with respect to dielectric strength. So thank you everyone for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Sure, I have one quick question. How does this apply to components that are recognized or listed when they get used in a, a, a fluid? Yeah, that's a great question, right? 
So to your point, you know, uh, recognized components like plastics, for example, if we know they're going to be used outside, they get UV rating, right? Um, so essentially, it seems like what we're putting the onus is on the, the fluid manufacturers, right? And not actually the uh, component manufacturer at this point, right? So uh, you're from Molex, right? Yeah, so your, your connector is molded or whatever product might be uh, of some polymer, right? And uh, you could, I guess, you know, one thing to consider, and, and I don't know if we have done that yet, is uh, require plastic manufacturers or others to meet, meet the requirement of uh, being submersed in, in, in oil, right? I mean, it's, uh, with gaskets and seals, we do that all the time. Um, but that's still, I guess this is all work in progress. So. Good question. Uh, right now, the onus is on the fluid manufacturer, right? Um, so by demonstrating compliance with the 60-day uh, compatibility test in 62368-1, you'd be meeting the requirements that are in place today. Uh, the requirements might change at some point, but uh, that's what we have. And, and would that be on a per-fluid basis, right? So like for e each individual fluid that it gets used by? Well, again, that's, that's the challenge, right? We have different types of fluids, yep, so that's true. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, if not, thanks everyone. Appreciate it.